Welcome everyone to Blackbird Writers Presents. Today I'm interviewing John Galligan, the author of Bad Axe County and uh, several other books with more on the way. Um, welcome, John. Thank you. Glad to be here. Yeah. Bad Axe County was a gripping and, oh my gosh, addictive thriller. Um, I want you to set up the story a little bit for the readers. Okay, sure. There are actually there are actually two stories. In one story, uh, a very special young woman who grows up in rural Wisconsin, uh, incredibly accomplished, you know, is on the rodeo team, is the class valedictorian, is uh, is knows how to drive every kind of vehicle and shoot every kind of gun, is the Dairy Queen, and she's across the state at an event, basically. Uh, hawk and cheese for the Wisconsin Milk Marketing Board when she gets the news that her father has shot her mother and himself, which she does not believe. And um, that event uh, basically knocks her off her pedestal and takes her on a long, dark, dark journey. Uh, and she reemerges 12 years later as the newly appointed interim sheriff of Bad Axe County. Um, and that's the second story. Uh, and we meet her on the night of an ice storm um, when the search for a teenage runaway uh, leads her to un un uncover the fact that her sheriff's department and her community has a long history of hiding sex crimes uh, and is in fact linked uh, to a sex trafficking route from the big cities in the east to the fracking fields in North Dakota. And as uh, an outsider, essentially, uh, uh, someone who's not part of the old boys network, she not only sees this when other people have been looking past it, she takes it very seriously uh, and pursues it. And so as the storm tears the, the bad axe apart physically, uh, their very first ever woman sheriff uh, tears open the past and some very long buried truths. Yeah. <clears throat> um I think that maybe for people who are not from Wisconsin, you might need to describe what the Dairy Queen involves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, the, the, you know, especially in rural cultures, there's the queens are very important. I don't really know why it, it could be that, that rural girls need opportunities to be, uh, you know, to be feminine or to wear nice, I don't know, it's, it's a really Tiaras. big deal. Like, yeah, crowns and, and be in parades and all this kind of stuff because, you know, they I mean they're milking cows and slopping manure all, you know. But anyway, so so these communities will have a dairy queen and an apple queen and a sturgeon queen and a cranberry queen and a, a snowflake queen and I mean I a musky queen and, and so forth. And But every community has a dairy queen. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the dairy state, America's dairy land, and the dairy industry is king. And, um, you know, the dairy queen is somebody who uh, is selected by her community in some way, some some sort of, you know, selection board um, to be the Dairy Queen for a year. And she'll have an attendant, you know, or two, and there'll be a, a junior Dairy Queen who'll be like a 12 year old or something. And her job is to represent the dairy industry and appear at events. And so anytime you go to a parade, a 4th of July parade or, or something like that, the, you know, the tractor will come by pulling a wagon and the Dairy Queen will be on there uh, waving at everybody. Yeah. And this is how Heidi uh, Kick gets her start. She's a very uh, accomplished and, and, and in, the, in the context of a rural community, very privileged young woman. She's got a, uh, her family has a successful farm. Her parents love her. She's good looking. She's smart. And uh, everything's going well for her when yeah. things crash and she has to rebuild herself. Right. And, and then so and she's, she's known she's as a Sheriff character. Dairy Queen later. Right. And, and she's she's a lot like the character in my book who had something happen about that, you know, at that young age of around 20 years old, where um, mm -hmm. uh, she, it changed her life, probably. And that's why she right. probably went into law enforcement. Exactly. Yeah, because she doesn't she never believed that her dad would kill her mom and himself. And in fact, part of the second story, the the, the later story, the story that takes place in most of the book is her as she's pursuing this history of sex crimes and so forth, she's also stumbling onto uh, the truth that she's long been searching for, which is what really happened to her parents. Yeah. So tell me what drew you to write from a women's point of view? Well, I'm glad you asked that because people don't tend to ask me that and I feel like it's something I have to talk about. Um, 
it's kind of a long story. Uh, I in in my the first book I have another series of books, um, and in the first series uh, called the Nail Knot, I had a character uh, named Melvina, and her name was Melvina because her father's name was Melvin, and she was named after her dad. And she's a farm girl. They call her Junior, uh, and she's this character who who can drive all the vehicles and you know shoot all the weapons and and solve all the problems. And she was such a favorite character in that book, of mine and of my readers, uh, that I couldn't forget about her. She was a minor character in that book, but she really shined. Um, and so uh, Melvina or Junior, I revived her as a minor character a young woman deputy in an earlier version of Bad Axe County. She again was a minor character. Um, after several unsuccessful drafts of that book, um, my agent, uh, Joanna McKenzie, urged me to ditch what I was working on. She basically told me uh, we'd like um, the same book, but with a different story. And I was like, okay, what does that mean? And uh, <laughs> But <laughs> when I was recovering from that, um, she, she was urging me to focus on this character, um, this revision of Junior, Melvina. Um, and so I, I, when I was retooling and recovering from the same, same book, different story, I did some research that really opened my eyes. And it was, uh, I was trying to you know, learn more about rural crime. And I, and I came upon an academic study where the researchers talked to um, law enforcement professionals across, I think, five or six Midwestern states, rural, all rural, uh, mm -hmm. small communities, so police chiefs and sheriffs and so forth, all men, and all, you know, all probably older white men, yeah. um, and they were asking questions about sex crime and particularly sex trafficking in their communities, and to describe, you know, the prevalence and so forth. And universally, the answer was, "What are you talking?" about we don't have any of that um and then the eye-opening thing was the researchers went and answered the, asked the same exact questions of rape crisis center women's shelters emergency rooms uh, social workers and so forth a, a group of professionals predominantly women uh and on the front lines of of basically handling injuries <laughs> psychological and physical injuries and their answer was completely the opposite hmm. it was it is an epidemic and so that was my clue to say, okay, well, let's take the plunge. Let's take this wonderful minor character who's a, you know, a young deputy learning the job and turn her into the star of the show. Because when you pop a woman into the, into the driver's seat, she's going to see things differently. Oh, yeah. And she's going to act differently. And people are not going to like it either. Um, and so that just seemed to me I couldn't I, I couldn't turn away from that. So that's how Heidi Kick, the you know Sheriff Heidi Kick, came to be. And so I found myself writing partly from a woman's point of view. And as you know, as you read the book, I, the book has multiple points of view. So it's not like she's right. the only point of view. She's the dominant point of view, but there are right. other points of view. Right. Exactly. Um, I I identify what people ask me. You know, why? How do you? How do you? Some people think I do it well, and so they ask me how, and I don't I have no idea. Um, I stay, I stay out of her private business for one thing. I don't talk about her bra size or anything. Um, I, I, I am able to inhabit that character through the things that we have in common, mm -hmm. being a spouse, being a parent, being a professional, being somebody who's underestimated, being somebody who struggles to balance her life. All those things just seem so easy for me to identify with that uh, right. doesn't, doesn't there bother me. And, yeah. common facets of every human being right, right. most human beings <laughs> yeah um so can you discuss the the male and female dynamics in your book I, you can't you cr cr cross that a little bit when you're talking about the the sheriffs and the the women working yeah yeah um well you know the book's kind of radical in a sense because uh, you know it really it, it really addresses the patriarchy <laughs> and it addresses, yeah. you know, addresses how how deeply entrenched that is um, in 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 our society in general, but even you know, especially I think in rural, you know, places that are a little slower to to uh, to change. Um, you think in this day and age that things are changing? Though? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And I think um, you know, I think this, well, one of the things that that's important to me about this is I I think that the patriarchy and any kind of any kind of power structure 
is, is reinforced by certain criminal elements. And I think that, you know, basically bad men keep good men in power. I think that, you know, things like rape and sex trafficking reinforce the general power of men and the general fear uh, and vulnerability of women. And so the patriarchy, even, even a man is not participating in any of this, uh, is in some way benefiting from it. It's the same way that white people who are not overtly racist obviously benefit fantastically from racism. Um, so I, I, I like to I like to think about this book as as coming at it from that angle um, yeah. that you've got a system in place. It's not that that men are bad or that even all the men in the book are bad or even only a few of them are. But the point is that all of them benefit from the few that are, and right. that leads to looking the other way and covering up and so forth. So. Um, yeah, and it's, you know, uh, I think people res respond to a women stepping into power uh, w with fear because of there, there are things that, that will be exposed by that or, or challenged by that. So um, yeah, you know, that's, that's, again, part of writing from a woman's point of view is understanding how a woman is a trigger um, for those kinds of things. Yeah, absolutely. Um, is there a reason maybe that you chose to write about this subject now? Uh, well, I'm glad you asked because there's something I want to get off my chest. Um, this book was written two years before hashtag me too. Right. <laughs> and my second book, which is uh, Dead Man Dancing, the second book in this series, which is really about racism and racist underground groups, was written a year and a half, two years before Black Lives Matter. So did I choose to write about sex trafficking because we were in the midst of a, you know, a national record? No. No. <laughs> Yeah, uh, it just worked out that way. I mean, I think I think if I have a, a an unquantifiable strength as a as a writer, it's sort of my ability to be a sponge for the zeitgeist to sort of feel what's what's cooking out there. Um, yeah. And I wrote about sex trafficking because it just seemed like the perfect way to um, engage a, a female sheriff, yeah. a female character in, yeah. in crime, because it would be an issue that, that, that any woman would would oh, man, fight just, against. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Just wake her right up. Absolutely. And after the book came out, I started getting contacted by organizations and, and so forth that were that were um, you know interested in, in sex trafficking and learned, you know, even after the book was out, I kept learning amazing and sad things about about that business. Yeah. Does the, the theme I carry couldn't... forward in the next book in the series? Or not? Is it not, th not that theme? No. The next book in the series, if there's a big social theme in it, it's it's about. Uh, in that book, it concerns a, 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 a underground fight club out in the coolies that is also um, sees itself as a paramilitary training camp for uh, preparing for the race war. Um, and that book gets into the unspoken, untold uh, racial past of this area. Which is that um, this area? Oh, I'm wearing. I, I dressed for the interview. Just a second. Oh, awesome! <laughs> Wisconsin. <laughs> there it uh, is. This, this area is over here. Uh, it's over on the Mississippi River. Uh, it's in a uniquely um, wild and rugged portion of Wisconsin that was not glaciated. So it's it's you know there's uh, it's it doesn't look like rolling hills. It doesn't look like Wisconsin. That area, of Wisconsin, was the northernmost stop on the Underground Railroad. Um, wow. back in the 1860s, 50s and 60s. Wisconsin um, would not ratify the Fugitive Slave Act, which meant that, you know, if you were in Wisconsin, you couldn't hunt down a slave for a bounty, basically. Mm -hmm. So it was a relatively safe place. And so as a result, uh, there, there was an actual community of African-Americans living in rural Wisconsin uh, for s several generations uh, and living in complete harmony with European immigrants who had no baggage with respect to slavery and so forth. So they were, you know, living with the Polish and the Norwegians and the, so forth. Um, and then they disappeared. Uh, and so th the second book just deals with that. What was that about? Um, and where are we now? And um, so, and that, that I'm working on and then boom, we get this, you know, George Floyd gets murdered and we get this massive explosion right. and this exposure of the uh, boogaloos all over the country that are, uh, actually out there preparing for the race war and, and are more than happy to instigate it if, if possible. Yeah, that's frightening, actually.
Yeah. Um, but clearly you have no fear of tackling these big subjects. Yeah. I'm not going to bother to write if I don't. I right. Mean, you know, <laughs> what what I spend all this time for? <laughs> Yes. Yeah. But you know, the thing is, it also has, you know, has, it's it's the entertainment business. Yeah. Um, you know, it's not a lecture. It's 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 entertainment. Um, Absolutely. So that's, that's the balance that you have to strike. Right. Um, well, so on a lighter subject, <clears throat> a certain baseball game comes into a key point in this book too, into the plot. Um, and I have to believe that Heidi might have found the missing girl without Angus Beaver. But um, would she have done so as quickly? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Angus Beavers is a character uh, that, that um, he grows up in a, in a real impoverished family in this area. And this is a very poor area of Wisconsin, um, but he has natural baseball talent and um, he gets sent away uh, to pursue that talent. And, but for another reason as well, he gets sent away because he's been a witness to something. Uh, and this, in this story, he comes back home, and um, when he comes back home, he becomes uh, a character who uh, leads. There, there are two. There are two missing girls. One's dead, and one's alive. Um, and he's, and he's an advocate for change. Yeah, and he's the, he's the character that leads Heidi Kick to the dead girl, mm -hmm. which allows Heidi Kick to find the live girl who's still. So, you know, still can be saved. So, right. yeah, I mean, yeah, I think she would have got to it eventually, but the second girl might have been dead by then. Right. Um, because exactly. She's getting real close uh, yeah. before she's and, finally And down. because when he comes home and he's been away for several years, he finds the place in just absolute ruin. Yeah. 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 That's a real place, I, unfortunately, um, that junkyard. Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and the pe and the people yeah. yeah um well the weather is also a key uh character in this book um uh fully evolved character <laughs> i might add um and in wisconsin we're used to these like weather extremes especially in the springtime and like you said earlier it begins with this big ice storm mm -hmm. and then spring happens um, yeah, we get well, we know, as we know, we get spring and then we get winter again and then we get a little bit of summer and then we get winter again and then we get spring and then, you know, it's so this this period in the book, you're getting some of both. We've got we've got it's already spring and then there's a storm, snowstorm, and then there's a rainstorm on top of the snowstorm and then it freezes and then it warms up rapidly and everything floods. Yeah, I mean, and it floods. This area that I'm writing about is uh, has been devastated by floods in the last decade. There have been seven, I believe, seven or eight 100-year floods in the last decade, which means they're not 100-year floods anymore. But but right. I mean, massive floods that that blow out dams, that um, you know, wash towns away, that damage property, that people die, uh, and this has been happening with great regularity out in what's this is called the driftless area. Mm -hmm. And what that refers to is there is no drift, which means drift is what's left behind when a glacier retreats. Um, it's all the ground up uh, rock and sand and so forth. And when a glacier retreats, that kind of just evens everything out. So this is not, there is no drift. This is a very, uh, things are very uh, deep valleys, uh, sharp, sharp uh, um, uh, bluffs and so forth. So it's very vulnerable to, to you know, basically, uh, storms, uh, rainstorms, thunderstorms, rapid snow melt, and all these kinds of things. So yeah, there's a catastrophic uh, flood that takes place after a storm, um, and that's very real. I, I've escaped with my life a couple times out there uh, when when a river is overflowed and I was in the way. Yeah. So I, I, I this this was you know I believe after 2017 they had a a really bad flood out there and I was there and had to escape a campground in the middle of the night um, and then spent the next couple of days driving around the area looking at what you know what had been wrought by this storm so that was the that was the inspiration for that yeah no we've had a few really bad storms in in Madison area too yeah. and just in the last few years but it's clear that you like had lived through that experience and mm -hmm. because the, the writing was so good. I was just in it with the rain and the water and oh my God, mm -hmm. 
<laughs> it was great, really great writing. Um, so many readers would like to see Heidi kick kick some more proverbial butt. And you said the next book is out. Right. Well, so we're, we've been talking about Bad Axe County. Yeah. Um, the second book that I talked about, the one that, that, that talks about the history of um, African-Americans in Wisconsin and the current situation is called Dead Man Dancing. That one's out as well. And that one's already out in paper. Awesome. Uh, the third book, Bad Moon Rising, uh, comes out on June 29th. Great. Good to know. And the fourth book is right here. Uh, it's in revision. Uh, it'll, I'll be turning it in this summer and it'll come out next summer. Wow. That's really great. Well, I'm looking forward to reading more of Heidi Kick's books and, and, um, and I hope I get to talk to you again soon, John. Me too. I hope, so, we, hope we actually see each other for real soon. For real. I know. Um, so where can readers find you if they're looking for you online? Or sure, uh, I have an author real. Facebook page, uh, John Galligan, author, and I also have a website, uh, johngalligan.com, J-O-H-N-G-A-L-L-I-G-A-N.com. Great. Well, we'll look for you there. Thank you. Thank you.